Hugh, what do you make of the trip and reaction to it? I think it's the best day of a beleaguered presidency by a lot, Brett. I think it's a significant historical moment and uh, all praise to the president for doing it. I was telling my radio audience this morning, I am reminded of not President Bush going to uh, uh, Iraq or President Obama making his trips or President Trump, but actually in 1940, FDR, who couldn't travel, sent Harry Hopkins in January of 41 to spend two weeks with Churchill in war-torn and bombed out London. And at the end of it, Churchill told, or Hopkins told Churchill from the Book of Ruth, whether thou goest, I goest, and your people are my people. Churchill wept. So for the people of Ukraine, this could not have come at a better time, and it's got to be the greatest morale booster for them possible. So great thumbs up to the president for doing it today. Now, welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. That is not by any means uh, the uncontested majority opinion on the conservative side. Molly Hemingway is the opposite end of the spectrum from me, I think, and from my guest later in the hour, Senator Cotton. So I wanted to have on this morning people who may take a different view from me. Good morning, Molly. How are you? Great. Great to be here with you. I do want to get to Ukraine. I got to ask you for it. You've blurbed a lot of books, right? I have done my yeah. fair share. I, I've done my fair share, too. I just sent an 1,100-word blurb. Have you ever done that to anyone? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That's impressive. I hope, well, I hope the book was worth it. Oh, it is. It's Judge the Parr's book about Clarence Thomas. And oh. I, 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 I hate to gush. But I, I said to him, give this all to your publisher. Let him use 10 words or all 1,100. I don't care. I don't know what to do. I don't want to. You know what the problem is when you run into a great book. Yes. It is? You. I don't know. What is, what is it? It's, <laughs> it's how to communicate that uh, someone who's picking it up in a bookstore should read it. That's oh, the art of the yeah, blurb. For, for the blurb. So I actually did get to read an advanced copy of this and I completely agree with you this oh. is a great book and I also am already biased because I love Justice Thomas but that's what that is what I was kind of thinking was I love this book I would love other people to read it and there were so many things to say about it I actually kind of had the opposite problem I didn't know where to go with it and I should have just written 1100 words to convey how great it is how superb it is how I kind of thought it was like two books in one too which I love for a Supreme Court book you know it's about Justice Thomas and his life. It's also about you know const yeah, the, this like originalist understanding that he is he is displayed in his opinions. But it's so readable and it's great. So I'm glad that you enjoy it too. Uh, well, I, I also think it's a third thing. Uh, as a con law professor, we always teach the cases. As a reporter and a journalist, we teach the headlines and the takeaways. But there are people involved. There are real people involved. And Judge the Par. Bring, brings Clarence Thomas's compassion for the real people to bear yes. on these things. Yes, I love and it. Really, he, I, I've always felt that about Justice Thomas, but he does a great job of showing that, that there are victims at the, at, in all of these cases that need to have their wrongs righted. It's justice. Now, Molly, let's get to Ukraine. Uh, let's, I'm just going to give you the open forum. What did you think of the president's trip? I definitely did not think anything along the lines of what you thought, and I don't really like, well, there are many problems I have with this kind of trip, and it really starts with just a disagreement about this approach to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, which I think we all agree is a problem. I think the U.S. has been involved in this war without thinking strategically about what it wants to accomplish and what its involvement will do. I saw all these people complaining about if China were to help Russia by uh, giving weapons, that that would prolong the war. Well, that's true, and that's what we're doing. We're prolonging a war here. We have not been pushing for peaceful reconciliation. If he used this trip as a means to get everybody to the table to end this horrific war, I would be much more impressed, but I don't see that happening. It sounds like people just want to prolong things, spend money without a clear strategy, without an understanding of where we're going, and without any understanding of how it serves our national interests. All right, now, Molly, I think it's a necessary step. The aid to Ukraine is a necessary step to stop the new axis of evil, which is anchored in Beijing and has an arm in Tehran and another arm in Moscow, and to stop the particular disaster that is the Ukrainian butchery from going forward. We've got to defeat Putin. Uh, my end game is that the people in the Kremlin just have a Khrushchev day where all of a sudden Putin's gone, and that's my end game. Uh, and I don't think we get there any other way. And if Putin gets to the, the border... Uh, if he absorbs all of Ukraine, I think we're in, it, it's sort of like the Sudetenland followed by Czechoslovakia, followed by Poland in the 30s. 
You're, like you're, you don't who, agree, obviously. Who, yeah, people who, who support this type of prolonging of this war kind of are all over the place. They went from saying we had to do this because otherwise he's going to take over all of Europe, which doesn't seem to match with how he even thinks in terms of whether he would go after an actual NATO country. But there's also the issue that we have seen in this war that the Russian army is not capable of doing that. That's actually one of the great things we've seen in this war. So I'm not so worried about that, but I am worried about further driving China and Russia together and Iran. You don't want to give them opportunity. It's like the opposite of the of the um, of the approach we took in the 70s, where we understood that we had to kind of work with China so that we could go after the Soviet Union. This we're just driving them all together. We have not gotten the support of the world in this, and so it makes us weaker at a time that we should be stronger against China. We should be pivoting and thinking really about how we can take on this adversary, China. Well, I can hold two thoughts. I can agree with the second thing you said and disagree profoundly with the first thing. But Molly, let's let's give each other a test. The best case against the Biden approach is that it's been incoherent and it's self-provocative. I, I know what the best case is against the approach he's pursued. What is the best case for his approach, Molly? Uh, I would say, I don't know, the best case might be that he has shown some restraint. I mean, the big risk when you go to war with Russia is that they have 6,500 nuclear warheads. We've done a lot of arming and amplifying this effort, but we haven't gotten as far as to provoke a nuclear response that might be the best i can say i i think the, the the best thing that can be said is that china has not yet gotten involved and that we've caused the kremlin to reel backwards and that we could possibly win but the worst part is that biden and now i want to go to my closing argument biden can't do anything else better than what he did yesterday because he can't talk, he can't persuade, he won't give interviews, he cannot deliver an effective speech, and his vice president is worse at it, his secretary of defense is a sphinx, and his secretary of state is unimpressive. I, I don't know that there's anything better he could have done than what he did yesterday. So, it was very theatrical. I don't actually think that Russians or Putin responds to theatrics. I don't think it actually affects that. I thought, like, for instance, that they had them, you know, the CNN was reporting that there hadn't been air raid sirens forever. Russia knew that Biden was there, but the air raid sirens go off a few minutes before Biden shows up. You know, very theatrical thing. Some people are very affected by that. I actually think U.S. foreign policy elites tend to be very affected by that more than more than anyone else. But I'm not sure... I think it's reckless. I mean, imagine if something happened when some of these high-profile people are visiting Ukraine. And we say we don't want to be drawn into a full-on war with the nuclear power, Russia. We don't. We say that we don't want that. We say that we don't want things to spiral out of control. But if something happens, some accident happens, some stray missile strikes while Jill Biden or Joe Biden or one of these top senators is there, this is very reminiscent of how World War I gets going not that people are actually trying to get into a world war, but a bunch of mistakes happen or a bunch of people making steps without thinking through what the consequences are. And that's the war. You know, everyone talks about World War II as the thing we have to keep in mind, and Neville Chamberlain. But World War I is the other thing we should be keeping in mind about how horrific global conflict can break out because people are stumbling toward it. Well, that is a, that's a fine cautionary reminder. I remind people of Harry Hopkins going to London in 1941 because the audience for this is not really Americans or foreign policy. The audience is the Ukrainian people who've been, and I know you have a heart for this, Molly, thousands of Ukrainian children have been kidnapped. Tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians have been killed by a butcher. He's a war criminal. We can't not do anything. This is one thing I am very appreciative of that everyone in America seems to agree at least about this, you know, the wrong being done to Ukraine, the horror being done on its people. The question is whether it's better to keep this war. I mean, the way the Americans have been fighting wars recently is to just prolong them for a couple of decades, spend a lot of money, not have a clear strategy, and then after 20 years or so, get out. That is not a good model for the Ukrainian people. The Ukrainian people do have this adversary on their border. The entire approach we've taken for decades has not really been helping Ukrainian people navigate a peace in, in the surroundings that they are physically in. And so I do think that if you care about the Ukrainian people, the children, the women, the display, you know, what's happening to their men, that you would work, you would, you would work as statesmen to get this war ended as quickly as possible. 
Molly Hemingway, always great to have you on. Thank you so much. You. I'm so glad you like Judge the Par as well. It's just such an amazing book. Uh, the People's Justice isn't available yet, but Molly, <laughs> very rare to find two people who've read the same unpublished book.